know how to say you just Something that many of you out there don't know and can't see from where you're at. The music stands say, we love your smile. And it's just, it's just such a friendly encouragement to, uh, to smile when we're up here. And I just really appreciate your guys' smiles and your sharing your voices and talents as we all worship together this morning. So thank you. And thank you also to the rest of those, the praise leaders that are here. I think Jody... Um, I think you're the only one currently who's here today, but um, Jody and Dwayne and Mitchell and Noel and we just have a huge, huge involvement of teams coming up here and uh, and leading praise. And even on days where maybe like our our smile isn't reflecting how we're feeling on the inside, um, this is just extra though. This is just something extra. Anyway, something to think about. Um, and, and a big thank you to, uh, to Jody and Dave and Jeannie and everybody, Jim, and all the people that are so heavily involved in leading praise here. So as I said before, um, just so misinterpreted, it's been a while <laughs> since we've been here. And um, I actually had planned to take a picture, take a selfie with everybody here and send it to Jen, if that's all right with you. Jen is my wife. And we, we are excited on many levels, and we are filled with joy on many levels, and one of those levels is that we get to spend our first year, not only the first year that we were dating, which one year is this Monday, actually, and then we get to spend our first year in ministry together um, as a married couple here together with all of you, and we are just so honored and so stoked that we get to, to that we get to do this and so thank you for for having us and and i'm gonna take a picture with uh i'll try to get this half first and then i'll get this half over here i could do panorama but then i can't be in it all right i think yeah should you wave yeah everybody wave Woo! i'll get a couple just in case all right now over here there we go. Oh, there's Gilbert. All right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to send it now because we don't text in church. <laughs> so uh, I'll show that to her later. So, of course, th this has been a big summer, and there's been a lot happening. And it's maybe you could, there are a few words you could use for it. One of them might be chaos. Um, graduations, weddings, camp meeting, camping trips, road trips, plane trips, uh, your car and tires need replaced. I don't know. Like, there's all this stuff going on in summer. And it's been a very eventful summer for the, for uh, wedding wise, for the Journey Adventist Church. Of course, we have Dwayne and Caitlin who were married. Just about two months ago, not quite two months ago, but yeah, there were a couple classes. That's exciting. It's so exciting. And also, Jen and myself, we were married, uh, we were married three, three weeks ago. It's been that long already. Wow. <laughs> and it has been an amazing summer. And if you haven't had a chance yet to get outside and get in the sunshine and the experience the heat and the sweat and the, the thought of, I wish I had air conditioning. If you haven't experienced that, don't worry. There's still time. The next 10 days, we're looking at 80 degrees. And it's not until, not until the following Monday, not the one in two days, but the following one where we see a 7 in front. Um, so we're up 80s and 90s over the next week or so. It's going to be amazing. Keep using that sunscreen. Keep drinking plenty of water. And I know what you kids are thinking. I know what the kids are thinking. <gasps> yes! School! Woo! Right? What's up, Dasani? So we've got school 
Coming up soon, yay! <laughs> now, when I was a kid, I'll confess, when school came back around, when it's time to go to school, I was like, oh man, really? Summer's over, but we've got such amazing teachers that I highly doubt any of the students are thinking that right now, because they get to go back and get to see Mr. Bennett, Ms. Westermeyer, and Ms. McLeod, and Coach, and Ms. Hannah, and we have so many great teachers there, so I highly doubt that these students are dreading going back to school. But I'll confess for myself, when I had to go back to school, I wasn't super excited. It's like, oh man, now I have to start getting up super early and getting ready for school. Not just, not just like combing my hair, but I have to also do my homework and have it ready to turn in. But at the end of the summer, it is kind of nice because you can start getting into a little bit of a rhythm, a little bit more of a rhythm. Some use the word rut. <laughs> and uh, I think it starts out as a, as a rhythm, and then it becomes like a path, and then it becomes a rut after a while. Um, typically, the word rut has some uh, negative connotations. Um, But the first time, let's see, and to a rhythm once again. Now I want you, since we're thinking of summertime and like, like vacation time and mountaintop experience, oh my goodness, no school, right? Uh, there's this little bit of, this little bit of, uh, I guess a mountaintop experience we could call. I want you to think back now, shifting gears just a little bit. Think back to the first time that someone asked you if you wanted to commit your life to Jesus. Think back to that. If that hasn't happened, I want to challenge you to answer this question for yourself. Do you want to commit your life to Jesus? Are you ready for that? And at this point, we've all been asked that question. Think back to that point. And it's almost a guarantee that when you were answering that question in the, yes, I want to commit my life to Jesus, it's almost a guarantee that, that, that at that point, your level of excitement was potentially the highest it had ever been up until that point, and for many, ever since. In fact, for, for quite a while, for myself, that was the, the high point in my life, was at the point of making that decision. Um, after a while, I realized, you know, there is an increase in joy over the journey and walking with Christ. And it's not just all about high points and, oh, I remember back when I first committed my life, that was the best day of my life. Because I actually think that life gets better after that point as well. Like it starts out really great, but it continues to improve after that. And it's through, through the journey. And it's just, oh, duh, our name is Journey Adventist Church. Of course he's going to say journey. But seriously, it's through the journey of life, of life with others, with each other, and with our God as our leader. But all too often... The sparks of the decision to follow God. That first time you gave your heart to the Lord. That day that you were baptized. Maybe even here. The, the, those sparks that maybe led you to do something like call up the nominating committee and say, sign me up for everything. I'm in. I'm so on fire for Jesus. And so maybe... Has, any, has anyone here done that? Just call up the nominating committee. Dude, just put me down. I don't care what for. Just anything. Like Daryl. I just did. <laughs> hey, hey, Pastor Jim, can you put me on for everything? <laughs> That's the thing. I think I already am. <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure your, your name's on like seven different things, and, and your names are on like 20 different things. No. But something happens after, after a few moments or years or months. As time passes, 
our joy and our ecstasy kind of starts, it might start to fade. And we might begin to find ourselves in a bit of a rut. At some point, the excitement of this decision to follow God and this decision to trust in him starts to be invaded by thoughts of doubt. And the excitement changed to something else. I don't know what that could be for you. And take, take this as a confession of my experience. I'm not assuming that each one of you is going through this right now. There may be some in here that are. I actually don't know for sure. I'm trusting where God is leading in this sermon. But much of this is a confession from myself of my own life experience. I want you guys to turn with me to your screen or in your Bibles to John 14, verse 6. Over the next four weeks, this week included, over the next four weeks, we'll be kind of going through this verse. Um, each sermon having to do with a part of this verse. 14.6. When you arrive there, you read the words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am. Those first two words We've seen them before. We've heard them before. I am. Today we're going to be talking about an identity. And not only our own identity, but God's identity. And I, I think many of you in this room have heard this before. And so today's challenge may be actually more directed towards the times in your life that have happened or the times that have yet to happen, or the times that are happening now, when we question either, is God who he says he is, or am I who God says I am? And then where to go when we doubt those things, or when we question those things. And over the next, from the next three weeks, then we'll go, I am the way, and then I am the truth, and then I am the life. Focusing on each aspect of what Christ is telling Thomas here. Um, Thomas is asking, well, how will we know how to get there? If, or how do we know how to get there if we don't know where we're going? Also now, I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14. And if you prefer to read it on the screen, that's an option as well. Now we're looking at here, who is I am? That is a weird question if you haven't heard it before. I am being God. Actually, God. But then we read John and we realize, oh, God sent Jesus, God is in Jesus, so Jesus also is I am. Yes. You're not wrong if you said Jesus. You are actually right. Um, here in verse 13 we read, Then Moses said to God, Moses said to who? God. God. Okay. If I come to the people of Israel and, they, and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? It's at this point where I advance. There we go. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am. I am the way. I am the truth. 
I am the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am with you always. I am never going to leave you nor forsake you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I believe this is all true. And I believe this is all good. I am with you always. Always. Not just on Sabbath. Always. Not just during your Bible study in the morning or or your journaling in the evening or your prayer time. I am with you always. Not only when you're sick, when you're hurt, when you're losing a loved one. I'm not only with you then. I am with you when? All right, this is the time. We're we're actually going to say this whole thing together. I am with you always. We're going to say that together, okay? I am with you always. That last word is the hard one to remember. This is a promise. I am never going to leave you nor forsake you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But inevitably, at some point in our lives, we find that we may doubt. We may have questions, and we may want answers. And sometimes we just want the answers right now, and we want them to be the answer that, well, we come up with, I guess. (laughs) We want the answers to not only make sense to us, but we want them to be so specific for us. And so this doubt starts to creep in. At first, it seemed to make perfect sense. Then doubt crept in. And there's no room for doubt here. Keep listening, because I'm not done. That was a set-up statement, okay? The rut, the rut is so deep that it could be hard to see where God is. Maybe you begin to, or maybe you began to, or maybe you will begin to wonder, or maybe you are wondering now if it was true that I am never going to leave you nor forsake you. You fail the test. And that promise of God always being there isn't such a booming voice anymore. Your car was stolen. How could God let this happen? The the person you loved the longest in life was taken from you. How is that God? Where is God in that? And maybe these things lead you to start to doubt. Maybe it's something else, something totally different. Maybe you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and you're late for your dentist appointment. God cares about everything, right? Well, why was I late? I don't know. What do we do when we doubt? That, that's really the question. Because I think for a lot of people, doubt is a dead end. Because somehow doubt is uh, just, it can be just a closed door. But that's not the end. Doubt, I think, is necessary in a walking and in a lasting relationship with God. So what do we do with our doubt? Well, first of all, bring your doubts to God. We were watching Tevia in the clip that we watched, and he's talking, why did did that have to become lame right before the... Right before... The summer, right before the season, right before, right before the Sabbath. That's what he said, okay. <laughs> right before the Sabbath. Why did it have to happen now? But who is he talking with? God. He's not talking to his neighbor about this happening and about God making this happen. He's taking his questions to God. Bring your doubts to God. Acknowledge to God your struggle. And if you don't think this is biblical, you should read a section of the Bible called Psalms. It's this great book where where they're just totally open, honest, doubting, joyful 
and expressing ex- just exactly what's on their hearts. If you read through that, it, it's just such an encouragement for when, uh, when we, when I, when you are experiencing this question of where is God in all of this? Read um, Psalms 51 and Psalm 69 in particular are great for when we are struggling with, with the confidence that we may have felt when we first made this decision to follow God. So first of all, bring your doubts to God. And God gives us freedom to express our doubts to him. And second of all, bring your doubts to church. If there's something you're unsure of, sh- share it with somebody. Now, be careful. Don't become, um, oh, what could we call it? Like a, a, a doubt evangelist? Like you're just making this one point and you're driving it home with everyone you meet. Oh, I don't think I have an answer for this, and I doubt this. Well, I don't know if you want to lead with that. But if there's someone that you've been able to get to know, and someone that you, you see, you know what? This person has probably worked through this in their life, and maybe they have some help for me. If we go forward with our doubt, with the desire to have, um, to have it remedied, or to have some sort of hope through it, then I think, I think the Holy Spirit works beyond our, even our willingness to, uh, to help us find peace, really. So bring your doubts to church, and don't, don't bury it under a rock or sweep it under a rug. People, people leave the church when there is an air of doubtlessness. If there is an air of doubtlessness, you can't doubt here. Everything here makes sense. If it doesn't, you don't believe enough. Well, I think Jesus actually asked someone to be one of his closest friends who was still full of doubt and still had to ask questions and still had to see the evidence for himself. So you have Thomas, if you haven't caught that yet. It's Thomas. And you also have Peter, Peter, for some reason, we think you got to be like Peter. You got to have the answers. You got to have the confidence. You got to be bold. You got to be willing to go the distance and fight the fight. But in the end, really, what happened with Peter? I mean, no, I don't know him. What are you talking about? No, I seriously don't know him. But then Thomas here, Thomas is like, I've got questions. I want to see it for myself. So, okay, think to yourself here. Think to yourself. Between Peter and Thomas, who, don't answer this out loud, if you have to tell somebody, if you're like, I'm an extrovert, it doesn't count unless I say it, then say it to the person next to you, so like, who would you rather be, Peter or Thomas? It's just a question. You don't necessarily have to answer it, but I challenge you, think about it. Peter or Thomas? It's, it's okay to doubt. Thomas doubted and was just as close to Christ as Peter was. Peter ended up doing things a little differently than he claimed he would do, yet who was it he was following? Who was the man that he was following through his ministry? Christ. And Thomas, the same thing. Whose hands was he looking at when he said, I believe you are my Lord and my God? Christ. So if you're looking for the correct answer, it's actually either of them would be good because of their relationship with Christ. As uh, Dave had pointed out earlier, what does that look like? It looks like pushing through the boring, (laughs) pushing through the slow, going on the sharing the experiences of the highs, the yes, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. The, ah, but I need to see that you're there. All of these experiences build a relationship. Thomas doubted and was just as close to Christ as Peter, who seems to never have doubted, yet still blatantly denied even knowing Christ. If If you don't want people to bring their doubts to church, 
then where will they bring their doubts? I'm not saying, this isn't like an ultimatum, but what will we say is a safe place to bring doubt, to wrestle with it, to share it, and to grow through it, and recognize maybe that thing I doubted, maybe I won't have full closure on it, maybe I won't have full understanding of it, maybe it will never actually make perfect sense in a way that I can explain it with a with a, a chart and a, a poster, and uh, maybe not. But when we share those things with each other, the lights come on, and we recognize maybe it, maybe it doesn't make full sense, but I see you walking in the same direction I'm walking, and we have our eyes on Christ. And so even with that doubt within us, we maintain a direction, and we maintain a course. And thirdly, I don't know um, if, you, if you have heard of the band Switchfoot, but they started out in the mid-90s in a garage, basically, in San Diego, California. And they started out making these like garage, um, garage band sort of albums, and one of the songs just starts out uh, starts out pretty rough, and you're like, well, I don't know if this could actually be going anywhere, but in the chorus, at the end of it, there's this phrase, and the phrase is, doubt your doubts. One of the things that we are also able to do with our doubts, and I would encourage you to do with your doubts, is doubt them. Maybe. If it seems like a closed door, I don't think that necessarily God is asking you to walk through it. So doubt that that's the way you're needing to be led. Bring your doubts to God. Bring your doubts to church. And doubt your doubts. And the next line in the song is believe your beliefs. So what is it that you claim to believe? Come back to that. Come back to that every time. And what you feed in your life will grow. There are doubts and there are beliefs. There is confidence and there is cowardice. I think maybe those would contradict each other. Um, I think if all we do is doubt, if we become a church that, oh, Blake said it's okay to doubt, so that's all we're going to do. We're going, to be, we're going to be building houses on sand pretty quick. So recognize that what is fed grows. And if we feed our trust and we feed our beliefs, then that is what grows. And I, I don't know why I don't need to say that. It's pretty simple. What you feed in your life will grow. And we do not hear because we do not listen. And we do not see because we don't look. Isaiah 42, 18 to 20. Um, we'll just, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, Isaiah 42, 18 to 20. This is perfect because this is about hearing. And if you heard that just now, you have God to thank that you have ears. And you have God to thank that we have children in our church and families that are bringing their kids here. So thank you and thank God. Amen. Verse 18 reads, Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send. Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of my Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. I doubt. It's okay to doubt. Look around you. Get out of that rut. And in chapter 43, just jump over to chapter 43 of Isaiah. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are 
mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. A couple things to point out here. He's not saying, when you see a river, I won't go, I won't make you go through it. When you see a fire, you'll be far from it. And when you pass, actually, you won't pass through the water. It's not saying that. It's saying, when you pass through this, I will be with you. When it feels like everything's coming out from underneath you, because that's the thing. Rivers are always at the lowest point. And if you are stuck in a river up to your neck, your feet are literally on the, on the lowest point to your left or to your right. Nothing gets lower than your feet. Of course you dig down, but staying on the surface of the surface of the of the earth there. The water flows at the lowest point. And so these illustrations where God is saying, even if you are at the lowest point and it feels like you're gonna get knocked over and pushed even lower, I am with you. Amen. And even if you're in the fire, fire is used to destroy. You will not be destroyed. I am there with you. The flame shall not consume you. So, if you're struggling with doubt, or if you come to a point in your life later where you struggle with doubt, come back to these verses, mark them, underline them, dog ear it. I don't think there's a rule against dog earing your Bible, even if your parents might have told you there is. I'm pretty sure there isn't. So, if you need a bookmarker, though, take something out of the front. <laughs> Bookmark it. Remember these verses. They're so true then. They're still true now. They'll be true beyond the rest of our lifetimes. We don't, we don't struggle with faith, though, without any, uh, without any sense of purpose there. I think when we struggle with faith, and we go to God. We take our doubt to God. We take our doubt to church. And we doubt our doubts. God comes in, reveals himself to us in a way that maybe in our, in our mind before, how we had seen him, was just nowhere compared to who he really is. And so, when, I don't know, this is how kind of what it was for me when I was in college. Um, I just got out of high school, and it was so easy. My first, my first two years of college was at, a, was at a public college, which was, it was great. It was a great school. It was a community college, and I saved a ton of money by doing it that way. But I realized, this, this is for me to own. I can't just rely on my principal, the, 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 the principal of the school, not just like principal. No, um, I can't just rely on the principal or the teachers or the chaplain or the pastors. This is my decision. And so coming to this point, my, my own experience was like, I have enough faith to pray to God even though I'm not sure he's there. And if you have that much faith, take your doubts to God. That, that's worked for me. And, and I... I'm convinced that if anyone here is experiencing that, that's a start. And that's a start in the right direction. And that's a start in a direction that keeps moving and it keeps getting better. And you don't get the promise of no more rivers to cross. You don't get that promise. You don't get the promise of, of no more fire to walk through. But you do get the promise that you'll never be left alone. Matthew 7, verse 7 reads, verse 7 and 8, Ask Let's read this together. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will open. So, this... The next few weeks we're going to be going through 
this, we'll be coming back to the same verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you're struggling with doubt, keep struggling. Keep taking it to God. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to explore this a little bit more and come to a, a little bit of a better understanding of what is this abundant life God is calling me to live and to experience. I'm going to ask you to pull out your connection card from your bulletin. And I'm pretty sure it's the back, because we always call it the back. So I'm pretty sure it's the back side here. Next steps. Check any or all. Fill this part in at the end of the sermon. Hey, that's where we are. Okay. Read along with me and make the marks as you see fit for yourself. I have at some point in my life struggled with doubt. Today, I learn that it's okay to have doubts about God. This week, I commit to taking my doubts to God. And I want to have a relationship with Christ where I can share with him the good, the sad, and my doubts. If any of these are your prayer today, I ask you to, to check those and um, Either, either hand them in or keep them with you. Keep them in your Bible. Keep them in your purse, near your phone, um, so that you can keep this reminder of what it is that you're deciding to do this week.